Hey, it's Michael Waltrip. Welcome to Waltrip Unfiltered. Got a great show for you today. We're gonna review all the awesome racing action we saw down in the Lone Star State. Plus, I ran into Blake Shelton on the grid walk. We're gonna preview Bristol. Had that bad crash in 1990, and then in 1993, I won the Xfinity race. Asked my now ex-wife to marry me in Victory Lane, and also did the first ever Polish victory lap in honor of our fallen hero, Alan Kowicki that weekend. Plus, Jamie McMurray is gonna be on with us. He's won all the big races, Daytona 500, Brickyard 400, 24 hours of Daytona. We're gonna do it all right here, right now. Green play, green play. I love going down to Texas for NASCAR, whether it's in the spring or the fall, the excitement, the enthusiasm of the fans there is unmatched in all of NASCAR. That infield starts filling up early in the week with all kinds of campers and folks that are there to have a good time. And part of the fun that I had down in Texas was I love the Fox NASCAR grid walk. I love going up there and seeing the drivers. And this weekend, I had a little bonus on the grid while waiting for Clint Boyer, who I texted. I said, hey, Clint, can I see you on the grid? I know you had quite the comments about the qualifying issues that were experienced on Friday. I'd love to hear positive Clint Sunday morning about how he's going to go win this race. And he said, yeah, man, I'll be there. Don't worry. We'll talk about it. And I'm standing there, and Clint didn't show up, but there was Blake Shelton. And Blake, Blake and I go way back. I'll tell you a funny story real quick. So about 10 years ago, Blake was doing a concert in Charlotte, and he's up on stage singing, and he sees me down in front, and I'm trying to sing the words to, Oh, Red was the dangest dog that you've ever seen. He's a four-legged tracking machine. You know, and I'm doing these words, but I don't know them. And I'm messing them up, and, and Blake's on stage, and he's singing, looking at me, and he starts singing the wrong words, too. And he said, hey, hey, man, quit. You're messing me up. Messing was paraphrased. But anyway, it was funny because I made him mess up the words because I didn't know the words. But anyway, it was fun, fun seeing Blake and hanging out with him. And uh, Clint finally did show up after I'd already left and went and talked to, to Corey LaJoy and a couple of the other racers. And Clint said, hey, man, I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to pee. I couldn't quite go 500 miles in Texas without a bathroom break right before. So it's always fun to see all the stars show up at the NASCAR races. And it was really fun to see Blake there. I'm really blessed. I got some friends that have a condo right off turn two. And I've been going up there for many years. His name is DL. And I met DL in the, in the infield of the Texas Motor Speedway one Thursday night. And think about this. It was probably six, eight years ago. And I had on my headset and I had a, I had a red solo cup that may or may not have had a little red wine in it. And I was just walking through the infield, seeing what the people were doing. And DL was approaching me and he had on a Kyle Busch leather jacket. And I, as he passed, I couldn't help but notice he was like a happy looking fella. And I said, hey buddy, who made you wear that jacket? And he laughed at me and he said, hey, man, I got this at Walmart. I only paid $20 for it. I'm pretty proud of this jacket. Well, as it turns out, we became friends. I've been to Cancun on a cruise, a NASCAR cruise. We've, he comes to my charity event up in Nashville. He and his daughter, Cheryl, and, and the family, they come to a lot of events. And, and we've just become really good friends. And so I'm telling you that to tell you this. On Sunday, I was in the condo watching the race. And there's about 50 people in his condo. By the way, he had a condo and the condo next to his condo went up for sale. He bought it, knocked the wall out. Now he's got double long condos. And so he had 50, 60 people in there. And I just like to look, I'm a big race fan and I like to look and see how people are consuming the race. There was about half the people out on the deck uh, with their earphones on or their earplugs in and they were, they were watching the race from outside. There was Half the folks that were just walking around indoors, eating food, having a beer, watching the race. But what I noticed uh, on Sunday was there was a lot of action, you know, up in turn two above, high above where the condos are located. You can see the whole track. There was a lot of action from front to back, whether it was for the lead or for 20th or 30th. There was always things going on on the track. And these folks, they were into that. You'd see them pointing at battles all around the racetrack. So I think the race was, was entertaining for those folks. And that's the folks that I care about, people that, that show up and, and are there with their, with their sleeves rolled up, and they want to see what racing is all about. And I feel like that they, they had a good time. And I watched the broadcast back on Fox. I thought Daryl and Jeff and Mike, Larry, everybody did a great job of describing the action. And, and I know every week I tell you 
statistically, it was a better race than we've seen lately on a mile and a half, and that was the case again this weekend. I'm not going to beat people over the head with that, but I just like the festivity, the, the, the consumption of a race by the race fans. If you dig down deep into the race, it was, it was pretty interesting. A lot of talk about the new 2019 cars that would be hard to pass. Well, the guy that won the race missed pit road once, had two pit road penalties, and won the race. Now, I'm not that smart, but seems like maybe he would have about had to pass everybody three times in order to get to victory lane. And Denny Hamlin was able to do just that, win and get to victory lane. And then Saturday in the Xfinity race, it was a strategy call late that I think propelled Kyle Busch to the victory there. And what an entertaining truck race we had on Friday night. Looked like that Brett Moffitt had the fastest truck. He drove around Kyle, just got in some bad, bad, dirty air on the front straightaway. Those trucks obviously are very hard to handle when they're all bunched together. And I think Brett just lost the nose of his truck due to not having any downforce on the straightaway or in the dog leg. And it, it just caused him to, to run into another truck and ruin his evening. But overall, seeing Kyle win two races and being lined up on Sunday with a chance to go sweep again, just an amazing accomplishment. He was driving his heart out. You could tell he was up on the wheel, came off turn two, swung a little wide, and got into the outside wall. I think he ran, what, 600 and some laps? I mean, isn't a guy allowed to hit the wall once out of 600 and some tries around the track? I mean, I thought he did a great job and still salvaged a top 10 finish. So for me, for what I saw and what I tasted, I love the action in, in Texas, and I can't wait for Bristol this weekend. We're going to go short tracking, and Bristol is such a fun place to go racing, and I look forward to see what goes down up in eastern Tennessee. Who's the favorite? you got to like Kyle Busch. He always runs well there, obviously. But I'm looking to see what Kevin Harvick does. He's been consistent and steady. I think he can win Bristol. I think he's going to be the guy that I'm going to have my eye on to see what happens when we get up to Tennessee. So it's going to be a fun weekend of racing. We've got the Xfinity cars on Saturday, the Cup Boys on Sunday. And just take it all in. The first short track of the season saw a dominating performance by Brad Keselowski. I mean, he took control of that race, and he closed the deal. Let me remind you of something. If you're talking and thinking about short track racing with the new car or Texas with the new car, you remember a couple of years ago, Brad Keselowski led nearly 300 laps at that race in Texas. And late, Jimmy Johnson tracked him down and won. But did you hear what I said? He led 300 and some laps. Can somebody have that type of dominating performance at Bristol? Or will we see what we saw at Texas this past weekend with many different leaders and many different lead changes? To me, that's going to be fun to follow. I think each week that we see these new 2019 cars racing each other, the teams are learning more and more, and it's just going to become more and more competitive. It's already very captivating to me to see how they're going to operate, and I can't wait to watch the cars attack the banks at Bristol. One subject that I know will always be brought up when I head to Bristol, especially in the springtime, is that huge crash I had there. It was in the Xfinity race, April 7th, 1990. I came off turn two. I caught a bump by Robert Presley into the wall. I went, well, part of the wall. I hit the guardrail. The guardrail gave way. I hit the end of the concrete wall, and the car, it just blew up. And there's no other way to describe it. Unless you're my brother, Daryl. When they interviewed him, he said the car just disintegrated. And I guess disintegrated is a word we use in Kentucky. Anyway, you get the point. The car just blew into pieces. People in the stands, uh, my friends down on pit road, they just thought they saw Michael Waltrip get killed. There was no way anybody could survive a crash that looked like that. But somehow they peeled the sheet metal away. My feet were on the ground. There was no floorboard under me. The steering wheel was off to the right somewhere. I was just sitting there, nothing in front of me. The car had just torn into pieces, and I was fine, sitting there looking up at people, thinking, why, why are y'all so concerned? I feel fine. I later saw the video and understood their concern, but I'll tell you a side note on that. It's, it's, this is the best part. I'm in the infield care center, and Dale Earnhardt comes in, and he said, man, you're one tough son of a bitch, I'll tell you that. That, that was incredible. You know, Dale, Dale was the toughest guy there was, and so when everybody would come in to see how I was doing, I said, I'm fine. Y'all know what? 
Dale Earnhardt thinks I'm tough. What do you think about that? I thought that was pretty special. They put me on a helicopter, flew me to the hospital. I had to spend the night, checked out the next morning, and race the next day at Bristol. Wow, what a memory that is. <laughs> and when they came to interview me, I wasn't quite as sophisticated back then as I am now. I came out of the infield care center, and the reporters grabbed me. And uh, you have to listen to what I said. Yeah, Ben, I think I'm all right. Uh, got some contusions and a little bit of confusion, but uh, that's probably not too unusual. We all got a pretty good laugh out of that. But I was really concerned about the Kool-Aid man. I was driving the Kool-Aid car, and man, was he a mess. <laughs> From the big crash in 1990, a couple years later, 1993, the spring, we all headed to Bristol, and we lost Alan Kowicki. Alan died in a tragic plane crash. He was the 1992 champion, and, and uh, unfortunately, we lost him that spring. And the first race after Alan's death was the, the Bush race on Saturday. And, and fortunately, I was able to win. I drove, drove to victory lane. And when I took the checkered flag, I turned around and, and did a Polish victory lap in honor of Alan. When Alan would win a race, he would drive around the track the wrong way to celebrate. And he was Polish, and that was his way to, to salute his heritage and say thank you to the fans, put his, put his driver's side of the car right out next to the fans, waving the checkered flag. It was a great celebration, and I honored him that day by doing one of those. And then when I got to Victory Lane, my girlfriend at the time – Buffy was there, and Buffy is the mother of Miss Macy Waltrip. And Buffy and I aren't married anymore, but we're still good friends. And those memories are just some of the things that I cherish. Jamie McMurray, as they come to turn four, he'll have to go to the high side, though. McMurray will guard that line. Crash at the back, never mind. Green flag still out. Checkered flag in the air. The 52nd Daytona flag on the right to Jamie yes. McMurray. Yes! Jamie, baby. It's a pleasure to have my buddy Jamie McMurray join me today on the podcast. Jamie, thank you so much for listening and and watching and now participating. Yeah, I'm excited. You uh, you sent your I guess your first podcast mm -hmm. was it the first was it Denny? Yeah, it was, Denny and it was my second, but it second. was Denny. Yeah, my you first sent that to was me. I worked out to it. I ran to it. Nice. Yeah, it was good. Joplin, Missouri. Grew up there. Showed up in NASCAR 2001. Tell him with with great hair. I mean, maybe some of the best epic, hair. Epic I mean, the hair best hair I've ever seen. So <laughs> we know, we know, sort of. If you look at the, if you Google it, you kind of start in 01. Did you I, Google me? I did. Yeah. And I knew you from day one. How it was go karting that got you going, right? Yeah, I I got a go kart uh, three days before my eighth birthday, and the reason I got it three days before my eighth birthday is because there was a race, and uh, my yeah my my mom and dad and I went out to the go kart track and. And we raced, and and I finished third, which was last. <laughs> yes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, then I was hooked. On, you know, when I was a kid, my mom was a school teacher, so she had the summers off, and we would keep the the go kart that we had at the go kart track, and she would take me out there every day at like nine or ten in the morning, and there was a golf cart that she would sit on. I don't, I don't know why there was a golf cart there, but there was a golf cart there, and she would sit on it, and she'd fill that thing up with the gas, start it, and I would ride around, <laughs> so it ran out of gas. <laughs> And then she'd fill it back up, and she'd just sit on this golf cart and read a book while I rode around all day. Well, you know what I love about these stories? So my, mine's the same as yours. I was 12, <laughs> though, and I, I got a go-kart, and I went and, and raced and had Ross Chastain on last week. His family got him. In, and it's family. You know, mm -hmm. it's always about your mom and dad and, and your brothers and sisters. And I, I love that part of it. And what what – Tell me your memories of mom and dad and all that they meant to you. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you bring that up because my wife grew up in what I would say is a normal childhood. Um, and we didn't. We did not. No, <laughs> you didn't. Clearly not normal. <laughs> um, but, you know, she has made comments to me because I think I did go to my prom, but there was a lot of things in school that I missed. And she's like, you know, she has great memories of those. And she's like, gosh, I, it stinks that you missed out on that. And, and I tell her, I'm like, I didn't miss out on anything. I was like... I got to do, I had these, I didn't have friends in my hometown. I had friends everywhere and we would meet up on the weekends. And I mean, I had so much fun on the weekends racing go-karts. My, 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 my mom was a school teacher. And my dad was a part salesman. We had this big RV and my dad would pick my mom up on Friday at like two or three o'clock whenever school got out. 
Then they would come by in the RV and pick me up. And behind the RV was our trailer with all of our stuff in it. <laughs> and we would leave and go go kart racing every weekend. And it was, I mean, it was, you know, I, it was great memories. I can't, like, we used to, like, joke around about how much my dad, because you know, your dad would yell all the time because you're always doing something to get in trouble. And I'm that dad now. But, like, we just used to terrorize my father in that motorhome to where his blood pressure was pegged every day. <laughs> now you're a dad. You made a huge decision to stop racing full time mm-hmm. last year. Did that have a lot to do with the fact that you're a dad to Carter and Hazel? It, uh, you know, I bought a, uh, I bought a brand new motorhome uh, last year with bunk beds in it because I wanted my family to come more. But it, Christy and I kind of sat down, you know, as a, as a family, and and she, I th- and she has a super valid point. She's like, I don't really think it's fair, even though our kids liked coming to the racetrack. She goes, I don't think it's fair to them that that they're missing out on birthday parties and and all the stuff that she thinks is normal growing up, right? Kind of like what we just talked about. Uh, you know, she's like, I, I think they should stay at home and do all those things. And and you know this as well as anybody. Motorhome life is pretty cool for the first couple of weeks, and then it's not that great being in the motorhome, and especially if you get a couple of rainy weekends. And it's hard when it's, you know, just you and your spouse in the bus. But when you add a couple of kids, it's a pretty tight, tight area. And, and it's it's hard as a parent. Like, it's it's hard with, with kids. And so, you know, my family just wasn't coming as much anymore. And, um, you know, it became harder and harder to, to leave on the uh, on the weekends because our, when, you know, when your kids are, it you know, you want to see your kid take the first step or speak the first word. And then, you know, then all of a sudden you want to go be a part of all of those football games or soccer games or cheerleading, whatever it is. And and I was I wasn't missing out on that, but I was getting ready to. And, yeah, that had a huge effect on on, you know, what I wanted to do. I think that's I'm so happy for you that you're comfortable to make that decision and you you get to have those (laughs) moments because I you watched my daughter, Macy, grow up. And now she's a junior at the University of Michigan, and she's she's a, a young woman and and out on the world and and I have I have precious memories of those those days together. But you're right, there's a lot I missed out on, and yeah. I, I I hate that, and I'm glad that you made that decision. Yeah, well, when I ran into Macy at Daytona this year, she said hi to me, and I kind of looked at her and I was like, hey. I'm like, I wonder who this is saying hi to me. I didn't even recognize her. It's crazy how grown up she is now. Yeah, it's 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 amazing where she is in life, and I'm I'm thankful for for her mom and and for her the, the young lady that she is. So you made that decision, and you you have a new home here at Fox, and you're doing yeah. a great job. You you don't look like a minion, if you ask me. You look normal. That's because you're big, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's funny. Um, so Fox has been really fun, and honestly, like the shows that I've got to do with you, um, I don't know if, if people can appreciate your your talent level on TV. I know that sometimes you come across and you, you kind of play the, the silly guy, right? But it's incredible to watch you turn it on and how much you know about our sport, and I think more importantly, like how much you give back to it and what the history of the sport means. Um, so, you know, and I said that to you when we got to do this show together, you know, I really enjoyed getting to work with you because you made it fun, and that's one of the, the, the most important important things you know within the this facility here at fox um you know they're like we want to be very informative but yeah. we also want to have a good time right and you make that fun and also i feel like you give some great information um so i've enjoyed my time getting to work with you uh, but it's also been fun to get to work with you know i, I worked with regan smith and and obviously shannon spake and adam alexander larry mcreynolds i have a whole new appreciation for all the stuff that's going on in Larry McReynolds head. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, it's unbelievable the don't, stats that he knows. Don't you think that's a crew chief mentality? I don't though, that know. You, it's you, almost you, disturbing the it, things that he knows. And this is, I think those guys that set up on the pit box and all their gears are working like that. And he, he – I think he still thinks he's sitting on the pit box. I think that he he does still think, but I will tell you, like the what what people don't know at home is how hard he works. Right, like, man, that guy is here. He's the first one here. He's typically when, he's never in a hurry to leave, um, and he's always studying. and And it uh, it's really fun to kind of watch him talk about things because he he has a little different perspective. But man, his his knowledge of the sport and and uh, the stats, like he, his memory is incredible. Yeah, and make it makes you want to know more, right? It makes Absolutely. you want to well, study. Well, you you don't want to look like the dumb guy on the set, right? Yeah. I mean, like you get up there and you're like, man, Larry just can rattle off ra- random random stats on uh, on all these drivers, and so yeah, I mean, I I want to make sure that uh, that I can contribute as well. And you know who else is is a lot like that? Who never was a crew chief or, or part who? of NASCAR? Adam Alexander. Oh, unbelievable! Uh, just yeah. the, the, the the information. You ever look at his notes? Yeah. Because there's not really notes. There's like letters. Yes. And somehow he gets a whole program out of six letters. But here's what I here's what Adam will do. He'll say, You remember what happened here in eighty seven, right? Yeah. No. I and don't so remember. I'll say 
It was something. You know, I, I never will say no. I don't remember or no. I don't know. I just it was something. I say I, it was a crazy time, and and that means I don't know what the hell he's talking about. You know. <laughs> yeah, Adam's really good though. He's uh, and he texted me earlier today, knowing that I was going to come into this podcast. He was joking. He said, "This is what he said. He said you should send Michael a text, <clears throat> tell him you're not going to make it." As an April Fool's joke. And I said, well, ironically, Adam, I'm not real sure if I'm going to make it because I'm at the doctor's office right now and he's running late. Uh, but And I told him, I was like, man, I can't wait to get on TV tonight and laugh with you because he uh, he makes the, the environment really fun to be around. All the folks at Fox, yep. dude. I think that's they do. what's Really the, good job. So let's just recap so far. Yep. I started with when you showed up in 2001 yep. here. Talked about you as a kid. Yep. Now we talked about you as retired. Yep. There's a lot of meat in between, the middle. Mm-hmm. between those. How does it? I mean, I want you to be on. I want you to tell me, how does it feel to know that you won the Daytona 500? I mean, you're just a kid from Joplin, Missouri that didn't know how all this was going to turn out when your mom was filling up your go-kart with gas and you're riding around in circles. You won the 24 hours of Daytona, the Brickyard 400, the All-Star race. You've won the biggest races of anybody ever. Yeah, I don't. I, I can tell you that, like, when that was happening, um, and I, I feel like you would understand this as well as anybody, I don't, like, it's really cool to win the Daytona 500, and then you get to go do that media tour afterwards, and you, you're like, man, it's, it's a pretty big deal all of a sudden, right? Like, I'm on David Letterman and, and these shows, but then the next weekend you show up and you have to race, and and it, if you don't do well, that's that's kind of what you remember, and I don't feel like you get to appreciate those things for me until now. And like, it's really fun to hear you say that. Um, I only have a few trophies. I only want a few trophies to start with, but I only have a few, a few of those few at my house. Um, but it's really cool because I, you know, I've got this, the Brickyard 400, I have the Rolex 24 hour, um, the Daytona 500. And then I want a 5k foot race. And I've got that on there as well. Yeah. Cause I'm really proud of that. Uh, but I don't, I look at that and it, it, uh, it's really cool. It's really special, but honestly, I don't, I don't think about that very often. Like I, I, um, I, I took the trash out this morning. I took my kids to school. I just, I mean, I'm really blessed of, you know, I've made enough money to get to live a cool lifestyle, but I'm just kind of a normal guy. And I honestly, I don't think much about all that. Well, the, the accomplishments, I think as, as, as time goes forward, you'll appreciate them more and more because people will say, you know, hey, Daytona 500 champ, how, yeah. how are you? Yeah. And you know, not only just for yourself, but how much that means to your mom and dad and the, the folks, uh, Mike Mittler, the people yeah. that helped you along the way that, I mean, they are sharing that with you. So that's special. Do you, uh, you said, you said your, your folks, do you wear your Daytona 500 ring ever? Um, Have you ever worn it? I, I have, you know. I haven't. Like, mine mine would fit your thumb. Like, I don't know who they thought was going to win the year I won, but he was a big guy. It's a huge ring. I I've, I mean, I wore it the, the, the next day, but I've never worn that. But my dad came over to my house today, and, and he st- wears it every day. And I, I, I saw that, and I'm like, man, I forgot that you wear that every single day. And that's really cool, like, I think, yeah. you know, for to see your dad being – because it's a it's – a, if you guys have never seen it, it's a really big ring, and it's obvious when you have it on. But, you know, he's proud of it. And I, I get that now that I have kids because if my son had a major accomplishment like that, I would want to brag about it right. too. So it's uh, and it, it's uh, it's not always, you know, when, when people – when I think about being able to win some of those big races, honestly, some of the things I think about are the sacrifices that my mom and dad made growing up. And we, we grew up in a pretty normal family, right? Yeah. I mean, like, you should, shouldn't have made it and got really lucky, too. But also people like a Mike Mittler that, uh, you know, I mean, Mike helped so many people. Me, Carl Edwards, there's a lot of guys that came through the Mittler Brothers team and went on to, to get to race at, you know, the highest level. And, and Mike, you know, stayed doing the, the truck series and having his – that's my dad calling me right now. Uh, Hi, Dad. S- hey, Dad, yeah. <laughs> stayed, you know, in the truck series and, and, and just loved that. So right. I'm really thankful for all the, the people that, that helped me, you know, move along. Well, I, I I just appreciate your story because I don't – I know my last name is Waltrip, so it's easy to think that my story is much different than yours. It's but not, though, is it? I, I don't think I know. so at all. I know. You know, my brother made my name mean something, but yeah. but I had to – It's I, really hard to stay, though, once you get here. Like, yeah. he maybe opened up doors for you, right? But, right. I mean, you, you – you're pretty old, Michael. Yeah, you know this. I am. Like, and you raced a long time. But I want to tell you, I'm not coloring my hair. It looks good though, and I think it looks yeah. great. I'm starting to get a little bit of a flow to it. I don't know where I'm. Because you need a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I'm heading with it. So you talked about being old. When I was a racer, I started running because I wanted to prove to my competitors, you might outrun me, but you will never outlast me. Yep. And I ran four marathons. Yep. I know you're aware of that. 
But I my, didn't know you ran four. I thought you ran two. No, nah, I ran four. My last one was in 2005, the Vegas Marathon. I made it in 356, yep. which was a huge goal of mine. Yeah, I, under four hours, that's a, that's a big goal for everybody. Yeah, yep. so if you figure, if you go run a marathon, it takes you more than four hours, you're just hard-headed and you're going to run until you're <laughs> right. done. Yeah, that's right. If you make it in less than four, yeah. that's an athletic Absolutely. accomplishment. Yeah, that's a, I know that, uh, you know, the same thing for a half marathon, like a two-hour half marathon is a, a really big accomplishment. Um, why don't you do those anymore? I don't know. I've gotten a little bit fat. And when I went doing Dancing with the stars i got plantar fasciitis in my left foot what is that it's a a nerve a okay. muscle yeah. it's a disorder okay i have a you have a disorder I have a disorder <laughs> now yeah. i used to have one in my head now i got one in my foot to match <laughs> but i'm ta- telling you all this to ask you this <laughs> what is your best marathon time uh my best mar- i think three three twenty something three that, tw- that i don't know that qualifies for the boston marathon well, doesn't i was right it? at it yeah so to qualify for actually 314. That was my that was what I ran. Wow. 314. Yeah. Is that 26 7 minute miles? It, uh, Ish? It's a, it's 725. Yeah, 725 yeah. average. I wanted to do a sub 3 because for me that was what I trained at and I thought I I could run at. Um, but I just, you know, I mean, you know what it's like. You yeah. get out and you start running and you just know like this this is the pace that that I can run at and and I'm going to do a couple more and I'm going to like Fortunately for me, I'm going to hit that next age group in like a year or two. Oh, and so you'll and be. so I don't have to run quite so fast <laughs> to make it in. Yeah. Well, I, I found something the other day uh, in, my, in my notes. I finished 14,438th in the Boston Marathon. How many people are in that? 30, like 30? 16,000. Okay, all right. I didn't have a because very Because everybody day. that makes, for the most part, everybody that gets there. Qualified. Fast. Yeah, I didn't really qualify. Fast, I got yeah. a provisional. Yeah, I was driving the <laughs> I was driving the Sitgo car, and you know they got the big Sitgo sign. Yeah, at, at, um, well, that's cool, yeah. but it was a good experience, right? Oh, it was fun. Yeah, Jimmy's, Jimmy's doing, doing it. Yeah, right. I'll tell you a funny story about that. Okay, we were at Phoenix doing the ride around in the truck, ah. and Jimmy said, uh, "Hey, man," he's like, uh, you know, he he'd been following me in my training. He said, uh, "How's it going?" I'm like, "Oh, pretty good," you know. And he's like, uh, "You want to go do Boston?" And I said. Well, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to run fast enough. I was like, Jimmy, I'm, I'm going to run. That's my goal is to make Boston. I, said, I just don't know if I'm going to be able to run fast enough. And, and he said, uh, well, you can, get a, you can get a provisional to get in that. And, and I, like, stopped him. I said, well, Jimmy, if I can't do it on my time, I'm not going to go on a provisional. And he looked at me. He goes, well, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I think that's great, Jimmy. Yeah. I think that's what you should do. But in, I was saying Jimmy's defense, he's running. I don't know if you've watched his runs. Oh, he's really fast right yeah. now. So. He's going to run a sub three, I think, marathon anyway. So. Is he getting ready to run another before Boston? Or is Boston's his Boston's next? in like uh, yeah, a couple of weeks, right? Yeah, yeah. We raced Talladega on Sunday. Yep. Flew to Boston Sunday night. Slept no for way. a little while. There's no way. Got on a bus a bus, and drove out to the starting line and, and ran back. It was And listen, this is a funny Dale Earnhardt story. So I'm running along, and Buffy's Buffy and Macy are there you know, at the start line. It's a big deal to have them cheer you, though. Yeah. It makes you feel good. Yeah. yeah. So they're there at the start finish line waiting for me, and Buffy's phone rings, and it's Dale. And she, Dale said, Buffy, what the hell's wrong with Michael? And she said, What do you mean, Dale? And she, he said, Some of them dudes are already finished. He ain't even halfway there yet. <laughs> he was following it online on the computer. <laughs> she said, Well, those guys are different category, they're trained yeah. differently than my husband yeah. is. Much differently. Yeah. Well, I, um, I, I don't know that people can appreciate the, the task that it is to run a cup race on Sunday and then just try to do anything on Monday, right? Like, you're exhausted. Yeah. Especially from the heat and everything that goes well, with that. Jimmy has to do that, right? Yeah, his is on Sat. He's a, it's after a Saturday night race. Ah, so he gets one day off, which that's a big difference, getting to have that one day. But I think it's still uh, – I mean, I've watched the Boston Marathon the last couple of years, and, and they talk about – I think it's called Heartbreak Hill, yes. at like mile 20. Right. And they, they say that that kind of separates the, the men from the boys. Yeah. It separated me from a 4.10 to about a 4.30. Why? I mean, is it just that brutal? Just, you're, you think. And another thing, if you ever do run it, and they tell you when you see the sit go sign, you're yeah. almost there. They're full of shit. How far is it? How far? It's is like it? another five miles. Yeah, that's it? a long ways, and, and you've you, already run twenty one. When, you, when <laughs> yeah. you're running, you're, and it's you know you're running, and it's right up there, and then you're running for another twenty minutes, and it's still right up there. It's really, really challenging. <laughs> so one last question, and, and I'll let you go. To, I know you got to go to work. What's your favorite thing about TV so far? You're seven races in. I know you've had a lot of fun moments and probably yeah. had some moments that made you a little frustrated that you couldn't do different or better. Yeah. What, what's, what's fun about it to you? 
What's going to make you want to do this for another 10 years? Well, I, I, let me, I'm going to answer that a little differently than the way you asked it because I've read, I've been reading, you read Twitter after the races, right? And, and I think something that's really important for fans to know is, and I, and I complained about this prior to doing TV, you, let's just say you run third at Texas this weekend and you get out and you do your interview with Fox and you get on the plane, you fly home and you call your mom and your mom's like, why didn't they interview you? And you say, well, they did interview me. And she's like, well, they didn't play it, and you're mad. You're like, well, why wouldn't they play that, right? Why wouldn't they have talked about me? I had a good day. I think that people don't realize that there's only so much time to work with, and they have to pick a couple of stories out. And sometimes you're not that story. Like, I, there was a couple of people who were mad that we didn't talk about William Byron this week. Yeah. And we want to talk about William right. Byron. It's just that Daniel Suarez and Clint Boyer finished ahead of him, <laughs> and they need to be talked about also. And right. there was only so much time there. And so I almost wish that you could you could do your your my career in reverse and do TV initially so you could understand – First off, they only talk about the facts, right? And if you're not running well, you can only turn the facts so many ways. You, you just tell the truth. And so if someone's not doing well, you have to tell the truth. And if they're doing well, then you just you know say what you see. Um, but TV, that's kind of opened my eyes of, uh, first off, why they pick the stories they do to talk about. And then um, just the fact that, you know, that, that just people just being honest. And sometimes the truth isn't always what everyone wants to hear. And you know what I, I think people don't understand either is the commitment from Fox. Holy it's cow. And I think commitment. the drivers don't even yeah, understand they it don't. at times. I totally agree with you. And, and it, I mean, everybody that, that I've talked to that has transitioned from either crew chief or driving to TV, they're like, man, you have no idea. Like, I mean, we get here at 7.30 or 8 a.m. on Sundays, and you leave at 7 or 8 p.m., right? Yeah. It's, a, it's a long day, a lot of rehearsal, a lot of practicing. And then you get on TV, and you get a producer in your ear that says, you got three seconds to say all that. And you're like, I can't <laughs> say it in two minutes. How do you want me to say it in three seconds? Well, it's been a lot of fun. I just want to publicly congratulate you on those two bush series wins you had back in they were epic i so, dominated the whole yeah, day michael two two awesome wins uh jamie pulled down when 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 you know nobody really saw it coming <laughs> that's an inside joke alex i dominated when i ran out of gas i think i'm gonna pull that trophy out of my attic and put it next <laughs> to my daytona 500 trophy michael oh it was atlanta and, and i Jeff was green and then Jeff Green wrecked me. He did. And then you needed about uh, another half a gallon of gas. Half a gallon of gas. Oh, well. It's been fun. Thank yeah. you so much for Thank coming you. by. And congratulations on what I think is a Hall of Fame career. And also, I love your insight and what you bring to Fox. Appreciate being your teammate. Thank you. I appreciate it, Michael. Well, that's a wrap on another Waltrip Unfiltered. Please be sure to tell your friends about us. Add us on your favorite podcast app. Give us a five-star rating. And just in general, thank you for listening. What a fun show today. We talked about some stories from Mikey's past. Obviously, the fun racing in Texas. And then previewed what we're going to see at Bristol. And so cool to have Jamie McMurray with us today. Nobody's won any more big races than Jamie McMurray. And it's fun that he took time to hang out with us. So thanks for listening. And be sure to tune in next week. We'll be back. We will certainly review Bristol and preview another short track in the south. We're going to Richmond. Talk to you later.